Hello. Good morning. Lovely to see so many faces on a Sunday morning. Thank you for coming, for those in person, and welcome to those online. Um, we are very excited for day two of Histfest. Um, if this is your day one, welcome. Um, before we go diving into our first session of the day, uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, so for anyone in the audience, if you have questions, please save them for the end of the session where both our guests will be taking them at the end. And for those online, a little box at the bottom waiting for you for questions. And again, there'll be a Q&A session for you. We have live uh, BSL captioning for those that need it, both online and in person. Um, and also we have lovely programmes um, and please, please check them out. They're shiny and you can get to take them home. And maybe you can get a signature or two. Uh, very retro 90s, so do it. Um, so yeah, let me introduce my two speakers today, this morning. We have Dr. Hannah Durkin, who will be speaking. She is a historian specialising in transatlantic slavery and African diasporic art and culture. She holds a PhD across a glittering career in academia in both the UK and Sweden, including at the University of Nottingham and a postgrad at the, in journalism from Leeds Trinity University. Uh, she's an advisor to the History Museum of Mobile, which is a working memorialization to the Clotilda survivors, and she'll be discussing what exactly who they are in a moment. Um, and then we have Vonda Vyborska. Dr. Vonda Vyborska is the erstwhile chief executive of the Society of Gene Genealogists. And that's a national charity that houses the largest archive and library on family history. Uh, she's also previously led the Equality Trust and is a visiting fellow at the University of York. Uh, Vonda also has a book on witchcraft in the early modern Poland, I believe, between 1500 and 1800. Uh, so if witchcraft is your thing, please check out her book. <laughs> Didn't think I'd be saying witchcraft on a Sunday morning. But there you go. Um, and she's a regular at HistFest, so welcome again, Vonda. Uh, so can you give a massive round of applause for our two guests? Thank you, Shafiq, for that wonderful, glittering introduction. I'm sure we're feeling very awake and reminded of our, of our achievements here on a Sunday morning. Thank you to everybody for joining us here in person, and thank you to all of those who are joining online, um, including my mum. So if I'm a bit more nervous than <laughs> usual, you'll know why. <laughs> um, delighted to be here and delighted to be discussing this book, um, which is a really fine account of the humanity and the lives of those who survived the Middle Passage. And these are very rare, as, as you all know, very rare accounts. We don't come across them very often. And I think it's really important to think about the difference in terms of the US and the UK experience. Because, you know, as someone who is the descendants of slaves, as someone who's looked at the slave registers um, and looked into you know, records that are those of my third great-grandmother. This is not very distant. I've also had lots of conversations in the US with people, and it's been very, very different and very marked to see that the experience in the US and the conversations in the US are very much more rooted in the US experience because it was in that place. It wasn't somewhere else. And so you don't very often have conversations about Africa or about the Caribbean in the US context. So that was why I was really interested to read this book and to find out more about that US experience because it is quite marked to the experience of some of us from diaspora communities here in the UK and in Europe. So I'd like to start really by asking, you know, why this subject? I mean, it's a wonderful historical subject, but what, what drew you to this? Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you um, for being here. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, so basically, um, perhaps I should, I'll explain uh, what the book's about a little bit, or should, and then, then expand from there. So, this is a book about the Clotilda, which was the last um, US slave ship. So, the Clotilda docked in Mobile Bay, which is a port city of Alabama, in July 1860. So, this is about nine months before the start 
of the US Civil War. So this is really quite recent. And the last survivor, who was just two years old when she was kidnapped, died in 1940. So I've spent time, I had a really lovely time actually with her grandson in Alabama um, at the start of this year. So this is very recent history. Um, but how I started on this project, I mean, maybe I'll start with how I started on the research project and then move back a little bit. So I was working on a different project, really, about, um, it was about um, a writer called Zora Neale Hurston, who was quite possibly the first professional um, African-American woman filmmaker. And she was an ethnographic filmmaker. So she was traveling through the South in the late 1920s. And one of the subjects of her films was um, what was then believed to be the last survivor of the Clotilda, the last known survivor of the Middle Passage of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so I was working on her, her films. I was trying to identify the people in her films. So to do that, I turned to this posthumously published manuscript of her folklore, basically, her interviews. And I noticed at the back of this book was... Um, one of the appendices had a list of the names of the people she interviewed. So I wanted to see if I could match them up to the people in their films. It was impossible, really. But I wanted to try and tell their stories. And I noticed that one of the people that she interviewed was another Clotilda survivor. And this woman had been thought to be lost to history. So I attempted then to identify her. I mean, had her name, her American name. And then I tried to um, uncover more information about her by looking, at, obviously, at genealogical records. I found that she outlived the Clotilda survivor that, um, that uh, Zora Neale Hurston had, had filmed. And then I carried on, I found another Clotilda survivor out who outlived her. And then it spiralled into a book, basically. Um, but to speak more broadly about how I came to this research, so, um, I mean, most of my, you know, most of my ancestry, half my ancestry is up from the west coast of Ireland. But I found out, you know, probably like 20 years ago, it's actually my mother who found out, um, that I, we have very distant, in fact, probably... A, both of my maternal grandparents had very distant West African ancestry. I don't know how my grandmother did, but my grandfather, he's, he's great-grandfather, no, maybe great-great-grandfather, came from Jamaica, and he was a mixed heritage man who became a school teacher in Yorkshire. And I was just very aware then, I hadn't learned about this at all at school, you know, it'd been written out of, you know, British national history, you know. This, so I felt this was really marginalised. You know, I was quite angry that here was part of my history that I hadn't been taught about at all, really. So... That sort of sparked my interest in Black Atlantic history, um, you know, to really explore it. That's, you know, with a PhD in it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the reason many of us have done PhDs, to sort of uncover those areas of history that, you know, we feel have not been given their due. And, you know, the, when, you, when you're looking at the archives, you feel as if you're bringing people back to life in a way that when we do family history, we're bringing our relatives back to life and just paying them that honour. So I think that's what I really love about this book as well, that we hear these stories, we hear... Uh, despite some attempts by ethno ethnographers and anthropologists at the time to rewrite their stories, which I think is really interesting. But take us back to 1860. Take us back to why there was this... Um, there was this kind of final, not final attempt, but this final voyage from that took that came from Africa over to the States. What you know, this this was eighteen sixty. Why was this still happening? Yeah, so I think there's probably a, a, a large conception still that the transatlantic slave trade ended in about eighteen oh seven. You know, when 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 the British Empire outlawed it, uh, the United States outlawed it the following year. It declared it piracy in eighteen twenty, which means it's a capital crime. But the fact that it it declares it piracy, shows that the trade is still continuing, that the, the Cuban slave trade is actually expanding in the 19th century. So I think about, about a quarter of all African people who are displaced across the Atlantic arrive after 1808. And in fact, it's like the majority of, of African people who are displaced to Cuba are displaced after 1820. So... The, the slave trade is basically is, is, is moving um, its you know, geographical focus. Um, but what's really happening in the United States, of course, we're on the eve of the Civil War. Um, and what's happening is there's certainly an awareness and US, heavy US involvement in the transatlantic slave trade. But of course, the, the captives are being taken to Cuba, not the United States. But what's probably happening, and of course, we can't be 100% sure of the motives of the perpetrators of the Clotilda crime. Um, but they seem to have wanted to 
you know, basically wanted to reopen the US slave trade. That, you know, these extremists, radicals who, who know it's highly profitable to, it's actually cheaper to traffic people across the Atlantic than is to, um, to you know, to, to buy them from the, from the upper south to the, to the deep south. So this is a hor horribly, highly profitable enterprise. And of course they want to, ideologically, they're determined to, because civil wars are all about, all about slavery. They are determined to keep slavery, the slavery economy alive. And I think one thing that comes out very clearly in the book is this relationship between and the primacy of the economics. Um, you know, this starts from a bet. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about the relationship between those who were enslaved and that those upper echelons of, 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 the, of society? Because, you know, when we read this, we're looking and we're seeing that this is happening in, in Selma, in Montgomery, in Birmingham, all of the places that we recognise from the civil rights movement. Mm. Um, so what is, that, what is that white society like at that point? And how are they striving so hard to, to keep, their, keep their economic primacy? Yeah, so basically, I mean, in terms of the, the, the bet itself, actually, so the bet, I was quite surprised that it was um, caused by, so it was long rumoured to have been sparked by a bet. And I actually managed to establish that it really was sparked by a bet or some kind of wager because I managed to identify one of the, one of the people who witnessed it. He was named in a letter, partially named in a letter. And I managed to actually trace his journey through the South at exactly this time. It told me exactly when this bet happened as well. Um, but, of course, the bet... Um, sort of minimises the ideological aspect that we emphasise as bet. It's a, it's, a, it's a sort of game. It's not a game at all. Um, and what I also found was that one of the witnesses to this bet, he was, um, he was basically just a, a man who was distribu distributing medicine. Um, and one of his clients was a pharmacist doctor in, um, in Montgomery, as you mentioned. I mean, he's actually an extremely wealthy enslaver as well, um, who's the even more horribly, he's the brother-in-law of J. Marion Sims, who, a business partner who was a notorious gynaecologist who was um, developing a field of gynaecology, and he's doing that by, through experimenting on enslaved women and girls. And this is how the field of gynaecology is, um, is, is being um, professionalised in the mid-19th century. Um, but the other connection between this, this pharmacist doctor um, that's really important is... Um, He's also establishing a church at exactly the same time in Montgomery with um, a man named William Lowndes Yancey. And William Lowndes Yancey is known as the orator of secession or, or the um, prince of the fire eaters. And the fire eaters, this group of extremely radical pro-slavery um, figures who, yeah, they're calling for secession as early as 1850. And, the, you know, these are the people who are really driving the nation to war. And Yancey um, is the man who splits the Democratic Party in 1860. And that splitting of the Democratic Party, so he leads a walkout at the Democratic National Convention, just as the Catilda's sailing across the Atlantic. And that split, so he leads that walkout of Southern Democrats. So you have now a Southern Democratic Party and a National Democratic Party. And what that means is when there's an election at the end of the year, the Republican Party wins, Lincoln is elected. Um, because the, de so the Democrats are split. And, of course, when Lincoln's elected, that's what sparks um, the South to secede from the Union. So, so I don't know whether that speaks too much to the sort of political... St uh, or it, maybe it speaks to the political status, maybe less than the wealth, but these are, of course, extremely wealthy enslavers, have massive um, plantations. Um, the pharmacist doctor I'm talking about, he had, um, you know, 100 enslaved people... Um, so these are, these are extremely powerful and wealthy men. So that's a context in which the Clotilda comes at this late stage in 1860, because basically a, a bunch of wealthy men have made a bet that they can yeah. do this. Um, and to move from that into the experiences of those who were on that middle passage, and I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about about some of the people and, and their accounts of that, because it, it, it's, it's incredibly moving. Um, and to see that throughout their lives they still wanted to go back to Africa there was no you know I, I, I read this book and thought I really want there to be a happy ending but I know there isn't going to be a happy ending um, but I desperately you know willed this almost to be um, despite despite knowing that it wasn't going to happen so I think what's what's marvelous is that 
characterization as well. And, and sometimes the book feels a little bit novelistic, which is quite interesting. So can you tell us about some of those people who, you know, have made that passage and, and survived? Absolutely. So I've already mentioned the two-year-old girl. So Matilda <gasps> McCreer was, as far as we can tell, the last <laughs> survivor of Matilda. And she was actually kidnapped um, and sold with her mother um, and her two sisters and two bro uh, three sisters and two brothers. Now, the brothers were left behind on the West African coast, so the family never saw them again. And when the, the remaining family members arrive in Alabama, the two oldest sisters are then sold away. And so Matilda is sold with one of her sisters and her mother, but she never sees her other siblings again. Um, and the Clotilda survivors, most of them appear to have been younger than 20 years old. It's very hard. I mean, genealogical data only tells you so much because the ages that they, the census records record are very approximate. But um, that would have been fairly typical as well. So during the illegal slave trade of the 19th century, about half of, the, the half of those kidnapped and sold were under the age of 15. So... The, the fact that the Clotilda survivors were, were children is very typical. You know, in that sense, their voices and experiences are very typical. Um, but yeah, they, they, there are 110 of them, and probably, as far as I can tell, about seven of them died on the voyage. Um, and quite a number of them who did survive lived well into the 20th century. So um, you know, Radoshi, another Clotilda survivor I identified, lives until 1936. She was probably 12 years old when she was kidnapped. And she, when she lands, she's sent to just outside Selma, and she's forcibly paired with a, a, a male Clotilda survivor. So she has a husband, even though she's a child. And that, that happens to other Clotilda survivors as well. That happens to Matilda McCrea's mother is um, forcibly paired with another uh, Clotilda survivor, and she has children with him. Um, so, yeah, this is really grim. I should probably try and talk about some of the more inspiring aspects of who they were and what they did. But, um, yeah, it's, it is a very sad and, um, you know, I, I, I can't pretend that it's, um, that it's a, a nice, cheery story, but um, they're still in it. Just in, their ability to survive and endure was just incredible. It was just a real privilege to be able to tell that story. And I think that's the important thing. You know, we we need to... You know, we always say never again, <laughs> you know, which is very ironic, especially on this Sunday morning, given, given what's been happening over the past few months. Um, we don't learn from our history. I think that, you know, it's, it's fair to say that. But I do think it's important to always remember uh, what our ancestors went through, um, because, you know, this has a, a, keen, a keen impact on the way that black communities in the US are living now. Um, and we'll come on to that a little bit later. But um, I'm absolutely fascinated. I'm going to take you in a slightly different direction here um, using my privilege because I'm fascinated by textile history as well. And I was delighted to see there's a connection here with G's Bend and the famous quilters of G's Bend. So, you know, on a slightly different note, it would be lovely to hear about that connection with G's Bend. Absolutely. And I should say, so the G's Bend quilting community of oh, G's Bend, Alabama, which is actually not very far away from Selma at all, they're sort of really famous um, quilting community. They're famous for their, um, you know, really striking quilting designs. So they're sort of, they're, they're, the, their blend of mixed material, uh, bright colours and abstract shapes have been, you know, likened uh, basically to, to West African strip weaving. And so the, there have certainly been rumours, suggestions, uh, that they had, a, they had a direct West African influence. And uh, so it was something I was very aware of when I was researching this book. I already knew, having identified the story or told the stories of um, Matilda McCreer and, and Rodoshi, um, another Clotilda survivor, in, in articles, when I was trying to see if I had enough material for a book, I was looking at, looking at that connection to G's Bend. And they were, I was able to identify Clotilda survivors who, who were sent there or sent to the area just around Rehoboth, which is just north of G's Bend, is likened to the quilt, is, 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 is seen as part of the quilting community of G's Bend. I actually, through genealogical um, records, I actually managed to establish that three, at least three Clitilda survivors were sent to Rehoboth. Two of them somehow made their way south to another group of Clitilda survivors in Mobile. So they found their way, after 20 years, they found their way back to their, their friends and, in fact, relatives. Um, 
so yeah, so I wanted to establish see if I can make that connection, I, I managed to, but this is a really important, it shows, what's so important about this, I think, is that it shows the endurance of, you know, West African quilting tra traditions. So the Clotilda survivors, almost all of them appear to have been this, from Oyo State, present day Oyo State in Nigeria. And that, that um, part of Nigeria has a, this long tradition of, of strip weaving. So there, is a de there are very strong um, links there. And I think also um, you describe how people are still um, trying to adhere to their own burial traditions and trying to keep the traditions that they learned, even as, as young people alive, in whatever way they can. Yeah, and I think what was really sad actually is that, um, so of course they, they, they do adapt, you know, they, they create their own. So the community in Mobile, which is a community of, of about 26 Clotilda survivors, um, they establish their own town, they establish their own church, they establish their own school, and they manage to persuade um, the state to provide them with a teacher. So they are determined to establish their own independent, self-sufficient community. And when they establish their church, they eventually establish a graveyard as well. But back home, they wouldn't have they'd have buried their, um, their ancestors on, you know, on their homesteads, basically. They would have buried them alongside, uh, you know, close to home to keep them with them, to keep their ancestors with them. And so when uh, Kazula, who's the, um, the last survivor of the Mobile community, when his daughter dies at the age of 15, um, she, she's buried in the graveyard, but he, he, he hates that. So he sort of creates a little um, gate fence for her around her grave because he wants to feel that she's protected, that she's still... And that's obviously really sad. Uh, and his wife, um, Abile, she um, she steps, she goes around the great. Of which all of his children predecease him. He has five sons and a daughter, um, and they, most of them precede his wife as well. And they die. Most of them die in a short period of time before she dies. And and uh, Kazula recalls his wife just before she dies, going up to their graves and and sort of acting as if she's pulling quilts over them. And so she's sort of, it's this protection. She wants to, you know, she's this protective act. She wants to still mother them, even though they're, still, they're dead. So, yeah. And I think it's really fascinating to think about, you know, when we think about the context of 1860, we're still in a period where obviously, you know, you have the Civil War, you have secession, you have... Um, you have lynchings, you have all of this irregularised, well, you know, absolute, we have the Ku Klux Klan, we have all of these issues, all of this racism, which is state-sanctioned and, you know, there is no justice. Um, so it's, it's absolutely incredible that this community does stick together, that people come back time and time again because they've been through that together and it'd be nice as, as well just to hear a little bit more about that solidarity you've talked a little bit about how people have come back people have been scattered you know obviously there were you know over a hundred people and people did die early people you know there were all sorts of things that happened and people were sold apart from their families but there was this there was this need to come back to each other absolutely and I mean the Africatown community in um, in Mobile is so inspiring, and it's you know it's, it still exists. I was there at the start of this year, but so this community. So what happens, of course, is that the Clotilda survivors are desperate to go home. So when their lips, they endure five years of slavery, um, and when they're freed by the Union Army in 1865, they try to save up to go home, and of course they're forced to still work for their former enslavers. Um, and they labour, and of course, they, it's, far, it's far too expensive. And many of them have children at this point, so they have a, you know, far more people to pay for to, to send across the Atlantic. But um, what they do is they buy their own land. Or, or those in Mobile are able to buy their own land. Um, it takes them years, um, and they establish a community which they name African Town, which is now known as Africa Town. And this is an you know, incredibly prosperous community for, for, for you know, successful communities. This is a community that expands to about two to 3,000 people in the early 20th century. These are, um, these are communities of you know, black-owned businesses. They're independent. Um, and they, you know, the, the black-owned grocery stores. They, and the wealthiest people in the community are the Clotilda, some of the Clotilda survivors themselves. So they, you know, they grow their own produce and they sell it and they you know, walk, to, walk to Mobile and sell the produce. So 
it's you know, quite incredible what they do. But of course, I mean, you mentioned lynchings. What's so striking is that um, in the early 20th century, there are, there are two lynchings about 19, in 1906 of two very young men. And the lynchings take place just outside Africatown, even though the, these young men aren't from Africatown. And then a year later, there's a, a, a man is lynched just outside Africatown again. So the, the, there's the, this use of, of terror, absolute terror, to control them and keep them in their place. Um, so you know the circumstances that they are um, forced to, you know, live in are just horrible. And I think what, one of the things that struck me as well um, was your account of the the white women's contribution as well. Um, and it would be great if you could talk a little bit about that. The, you know, particularly struck me, the educational material, our homeland. Um, and what was, you know, because we do very often think about the men and the Ku Klux Klan and the very obvious things that were happening then, but not so much really about the role of the women and the wives and what they were doing. Yeah, so the enslavers' wives and daughters. So, um, you know, what happens after, you know, after slavery, after the South has lost the war, it, try, you know, it works really hard to win the ideological war, basically. So, it, it, so the, um, and these, these are, of course, the wealthy white women. Um, these, are the, these are the wives and daughters of those who have, who have enslaved, who work, you know, they establish what's known as the United Daughters of the, of the Confederacy, which kind of tells you all you need to know, really. But they work to, um, to, to write history in a way, of course, that aggrandizes their uh, fathers and husbands. And of course, this is a time, the early 20th century, so the United Daughters of the Confederacy established in about 1896. And it's from this time onwards that we get actually these Confederate monuments that are placed everywhere. Um, they're basically a form of social control. They're a form of, there's this, you know, creating this visual narrative of um, these, these great heroic um, white men um, to, you know, to rewrite the, of course, you know, it's the, it's the gone with the wind version of history, basically. Um, that, you know, that, and of course, the, what that's doing as well as, of course, is it's, um, you know, the, it's the enslaved are completely, they're either written out, they're, they're euphemistically termed servants in all these narratives. Um, and they're, you know, this is about, you know, justifying segregation. And this is, you know, this is when segregation is being, we have de jure segregation in the early 20th century. And I think in some of those educational materials, they're actually taking the stories of some of the Clotilde survivors as well. Yes, so one of the Clotilde survivors, a woman named Buja Moore, who had three children when she was kidnapped, um, and those children were left behind. So she lost her three children when she was trafficked across the Atlantic. She actually lived until 1930, July 1930, so that's 70 years after she was kidnapped. All that time, of course, she, she never saw her three oldest children again, but she, she became a sort of celebrity figure in in Montgomery, which is where she was enslaved, because she used to catch the train into Montgomery and then sell her wares, wares that she'd forage. So, you know, berries and, and herbs, you know, um, mint, things, things like that. She, she'd sell it um, as she would have done back home. She's recreating the life that she would have lived back home. That's the tradeswoman um, identity. And she's such a celebrity in early 20th century Montgomery that she's, you know, she's referred to in at least one of these, um, these um, his these United Daughters of Confederacy historians' narratives. And it, what's horrible is that her story's rewritten. So, so this historian, quote unquote historian, writes about how um, Union soldiers ransacked um, Booger Moore's enslaver's home. And according to this historian, Booger Moore is just, you know, sort of uh, raging against these Union soldiers and this sort of cod African American, you know, racist dialect um and of course she wouldn't you know she could barely speak english um but yeah so it's, it's completely co-opting her story to to present her enslavers as the victims of, of history basically and i think that sort of is a precursor in a sense to as we mentioned before the the anthropologists the ethnographers who all of a sudden become very interested in these people and you know they become the kind of flavor of the month and people are beating down a door to, to get to interview Kasula and other people. And so how did they rewrite these stories? How did they use these narratives of, of enslaved people for their own sort of causes, in a sense? 
Yeah, I think it, it's frustrating that... So, in some respects, the fact that they do interview them is, is, is fantastic because we actually have their voices and, you know, okay, mediated voices. But it means that there is a record of their stories that doesn't really exist for the survivors of, of, you know, most other slave ships. So, this is, you know, this was a chance to piece together. And I should say that there are almost no surviving testimonies of women survivors of the Middle Passage. So the voices that are, you know, I was trying to put together in this book were probably more extensive than any, uh, certainly in the English language, that we, than we have anywhere else. But of course, they, you know, they, they see them as you know, the sort of relics of the past, as you know, these kind of... Um, and they're, I think certainly with... Um, there's just this, this failure to reckon with their, their experiences of, and, and to the extent that we would expect them to now. So they're more interested in them as, you know, exotic curiosities in, in, in many cases. And, um, you know, so using racist, you know, racist ways to describe them. And so, you, so working through the material, you know, having to work through all the racism. Uh, but what is striking as well is that despite those racist narratives, despite the, the racist frameworks in which they're perceived, they still manage to communicate their, their outrage, their sorrow, their humanity... So, I mean, the one particularly important book, um, well, it's the, you know, the only book that's written when most or many of the mobile community is still alive, a book by Emma Langdon Roach. You read most of the book, you think, this is horribly racist, horribly racist book. And then you get to the, the final section, which is about the Clotilda survivors. And you realise that the author of this book is, you know, she's, she's she, because she sees them as human beings and that comes through. And so their humanity comes through this book as otherwise a very problematic text about, you know, um, 19th century um, Alabama. So they still, despite, you know, despite the limitations of their interviewers, are still able to communicate their humanity. And I think you draw a lot on the work of um, Zora Neale Hurston, and you were talking about this was, this was the origin of your interest in mm. this. So, um, you know, I think, again you seem to find that her text is, is a little bit problematic as well because of the, the ways that African-American communities wanted to present themselves at that time. And, I, and you do see throughout this book that there is this tension between the African-American communities and the African communities, which I think you know, we see played out um, in other areas as well. Yeah, and that's because of the racist narratives that develop about people who survived slavery. Um, I mean, the Harlem Renaissance, uh, there's very few... Harlem Renaissance writers write about slavery. Um, they, you know, they don't want to be, understandably, they want to, they're, they're battling to prove their right to citizenship. And to talk about enslaved ancestors, you know, see, seem to kind of um, counter that, you know, that they want to prove that they're, they're middle class citizens. Um, now, Hurston's quite different because she does, she's interested in working class voices. But at the same time, she doesn't want to be seen. You know, she, she talks about slavery being 60 years in the past. Um, the, her words are saying, like, a patient is doing well, thank you. Um, you know, she means herself. I don't want, you know, I'm, I want to be a woman of, a modern woman of the present. Um, she sees, I guess, that emphasis, all the descriptions of victimhood uh, as a kind of reinforcement of the victimhood, if that makes sense. So she... She do, she's not in, interested in... I mean, very sadly, Barracoon, her book-length interview with Kazula, wasn't published until 2018. So she doesn't publish it in her lifetime. She, she, she interviews Kazula in the late 1920s. She writes her manuscript, drafts it um, in about 1930, 1931. Um, but she decides not to publish it. She's interested in other projects. And so it doesn't get published until 2018. And that means, of course, that Kazula's voice isn't, you know, isn't strongly heard and, until that period and, and time. So that resistance to, you know, wanting to be, you know, wanting to be defined by a past that renders you abject is understandable, but at the same time it means that the lives and experiences um, of, of the Clotilda survivors, you know, weren't heard until very recently. And also I think what's really striking in the book is that... The, those memories and the customs are passed down through the families. So you're talking to grand, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and the variety 
in their experiences. Um, if you think of Dinah's, I think Di it's Dinah, isn't it? Her children who literally every evening are told about the horrors of the Middle Passage and, you know, kind of beaten if they don't take this seriously. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that intergenerational aspect? Because I think it's, it's really, really important to see how this comes down through the, through the, through the generations. Absolutely, and, and there are, I mean, there are differences between the survivors. So, Poli Allen, who's one of the last survivors out of Africatown, he lives until 1922. He actually doesn't speak to his children. He has 15 children, but he doesn't speak about his experiences because, and his, his daughter thinks it's because it's too traumatic. So his daughter, one of his daughters lived until 1992. So again, this is quite, this is how recent this history is. And she said that he couldn't talk about it. Um, and she'd also said that he couldn't eat oranges as well, though, because oranges reminded him of home. Uh, so the, the horror, the, you know, the, the trauma was conveyed indirectly, I think. But in the case of Dinah, Dinah Miller, who lives until 1933, so she dies in G's Bend in 1933. She actually, as you, you said, I mean, she's viscerally... So her great-granddaughter, Olonzia Petway, talks about the story practically being beaten into her. Her great-grandmother wants her descendants and know what happened to her and to carry on her story. So, so this is, you know, the, the survivors deal with this, this trauma quite differently. Um, but, the, you know, what is inspiring as well is the fact that descendants have worked hard to, to hold on to those stories. So another survivor, Kanko, who lives until 1917, her great granddaughter, no, her granddaughter um, publishes a book, you know, book length, Two book, book length books, um, one on her American father, or oh, great gr grandfather, and another on her African grandmother, and you know, gets these published. And they're, and they're basically, they're, they're great booklets that they've basically got, um, they've got photographs in them, and they've got, um, you know, genealogical records, receipts, evidence of their lives, you know, uh, you know, material evidence of their lives. So descendants have worked really hard and continue to work incredibly hard to keep their stories alive. And although, you know, we often hear this, this happened so long ago, what's the point? Why are we talking about reparations? Why are we talking about a whole range of things? I think one of the things this book does really, really well is brings us up to the present in the US um, and the situation, you know, you talk about Philip Alston, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, visiting that community um, and so how do you think that this, that the experience and that the, the experience of the transatlantic slave trade and the impact of that has played out in the modern day US? Yeah, so I, I guess I'll give the very specific example of Africatown, which is a community, you know, established by Katilda survivors that's, um, you know, that's endures today. Uh, but what's so horrible about this community is that not only is it still extremely impoverished, but also um, there, the in polluting industry it establishes it's, itself there in the early 20th century. So around the time, um, the, the very end of Gazula's life. So this polluting industry, pa the paper mills um, fundamentally, these extremely polluting, it's one of the most polluted parts of uh, America. Um, lots of uh, descendants of Clotilde survivors, community generally, um, have died at young ages, they've, you know, they've been diagnosed with cancer at a young age. I mean, Joycelyn Davis, who works hard, she, she runs the, um, the Spirit of Our Ancestors Festival, the Africatown uh, Festival every um, February, which is actually why I was there this, this February. She was diagnosed with cancer in her 30s. Um, so they are battling for, they're still battling for recognition, of course. They're battling for, um, they have very recently, so the descendants of the, the, the man, in fact, there were three brothers, Timothy Mayer and his brothers, James and Burns Mayer. Um, they were the, essentially the men who engineered this conspiracy. And the descendants so, own most of the land. In fact, there were lots of signs that say, Mayer State Park, Mayer State Park. So they own a lot of the land around, you know, in Africatown and around Africatown. And there's an attempt, there's been a, an attempt by descendants to kind of have some kind of you know, meeting some kind of reconciliation, but it, 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 from what I've heard, I mean, off the record, it sounds it sounds a bit quite tokenistic on the mayor's part. These are this is an incredibly wealthy family, um, yeah, and and of course, descendants of you know 
of lots of you know economic battles and um, so yeah it's an ongoing fight to to get recognition and national recognition for the crime uh, the Clotilda the slave ship was identified in the Mobile River about six years ago now or officially identified so and there is discussion about I mean some people want to raise it I think a lot of the descendant community doesn't want to raise this ship right because what would happen so the ship would disintegrate for one thing um, for another, keeping to preserve it would cost a lot of money. And the view of descendants is that money could be much better spent elsewhere. Um, of course, it, there's the risk as well. It becomes a bit sort of show and tell or a bit sort of voyeuristic. It's like, what does the ship... But at the same time, the ship does provide that visual evidence that this, this thing happened, this, mm. this, this crime was committed. So I can see you know, one reason why it would, be, it would be a valuable thing to raise it. <clears throat> And one of the survivors did actually go go to the court to try and get reparations, didn't she? She did. So in December 1931, Matilda McCrea, who was two years old when she was kidnapped, the last survivor, she, she goes to... So what happens is um, Kazula ends up in the national media, in the National Geographic, and, you know, he's, he gets some attention in, around the time of his 90th, 90th birthday in 1931. And somehow... Matilda and McCrea and Radoshi, um, who is the other Clotilda survivor identified, who lives until 1936, they somehow hear about this recognition, you know, this, this attention he's been getting around the time of his 90th birthday. So they somehow managed to find their way down from just outside Selma to Mobile, and this is 150 miles. So I don't know, they wouldn't have been able to drive. I don't know how, how exactly they find their way to, to meet him. And this is the first time that Matilda McCrea and Radoshi have seen the site of the Clotilda's landing since, since they arrived in um, Alabama in 1860. And, and Matilda McCreer is so moved by this experience because she, because she was two years old, she has no memory of the Middle Passage, so she has no memory of her landing. So she's seeing, you know, seeing the site of the Clotilda's landing. And I should say as well, the Clotilda was visible in the Mobile River, low tide. Everyone could see this, you know, this crime. Everyone could see it. Everyone knew that it happened. Um, but she's so moved by this experience of going there, meeting Kazula and... Um, that when she goes back to uh, back home to the to the plantation where she's still labouring, the cotton plantation, she decides she's going to walk 15 miles. And this is a woman in her mid 70s by this point. So she walks 15 miles with with about two, of, I think, two of her sons to Dallas County Courthouse to demand reparations. And of course, the this is the height of the Great Depression. Um, so I'm sure she had a major financial reason for um, for travelling there. And of course, the white judge turns her away um, but what's striking is the fact that this is this courthouse Dallas County Courthouse if anyone's seen Selma the film Selma Ava DuVernay's film Selma this is the kind of site of where Selma voting rights campaigners gather to demand their voting rights which leads to the Selma to Montgomery marches the march from the two cities um, which leads to the passing of the voting rights act the 1965 voting rights act which is a major key piece of civil rights legislation in the 1960s. So she's kind of, you know, in a sense, a bit of a forerunner for that. Uh, and I should say as well that Radoshi was friends with um, one, of the, one of the key figures in that um, summer voting rights campaign, a woman named Amelia Boynton Robinson, who di actually only died in 2015. So, again, very recent history. Thank you. Um, I... We highly recommend reading this book, um, and I think it is an absolutely sensational tribute to telling those stories. You know, we cannot find the stories of the 12 and a half million people who were transported, kidnapped from Africa um, and who endured the Middle Passage. But I think this is a, this is a, a way of understanding you know, just, just what happened and, and the horrors that happened there. Um, there is no easy, happy point to leave this on um, because this isn't an easy, happy book and this isn't easy, happy history. But a huge thank you because we know the emotional labour that goes into researching this sort of work um, and dealing with the, the testimonies and the, the content of this type of history. So thank you for that. Thank you. It will bring the stories to many more people. Um, we're now going to turn to questions um, and people online and Bandit Queen, I'm calling you because you are a firm favourite at HistFest, so I'm hoping that you'll be tuning in. 
Um, but first of all, I'm going to turn to the audience. We have roving mics, so do we have any questions, please? There's lots of hands there. Um, there's a lady down here at the front. Hi. Thank you. Um, I just wondered how you protected your own mental health while you were doing all this research, because it must be pretty harrowing to, to read it all and then put it into a book. Yeah, I got quite angry quite a lot. But I think the flip side, you know, when you when you find out exactly what was what was done, and uh, and especially as I'm writing about children as well, that's that's really quite um, it's it's a very dark history in lots of ways. But I think what was the flip side was that because I, they were so inspiring, that you know that this I, you know I was so driven by that by the fact that they had you know, what they endured and the ways in which they, you know, their, their love for their families was so, so obvious, their effort to, um, to survive and endure and create a community, you know, for their, for their children and uh, their descendants. So I think, yeah, I think, and the fact as well, of course, that as you, you know, saying this, is, there are so few, it's the story, the voices of the, you know, of the middle passage survive, middle passage uh, the 12 and a half million, who, not all of whom, only about 10.7 million actually survived the Middle Passage. So I was trying, you know, I was just, I think I felt this responsibility. You know, when I, when I encountered the name of, you know, Radoshi or Sally Smith, as she was in that, um, in that appendix in Soren Hurston's book, I think then I was just, you know, I felt that responsibility to just keep digging. Um, and I was so driven that I, nothing would have stopped me, I think. So thank you. Great question. Um, the, yeah, <laughs> lots of questions here. There's a lady, someone at the back there, in the back row. Hello, I just want to ask you, um, did the Clotida survivors, did they maintain their languages like the Geechee communities in the South Sea Islands? And also how did the Africa town compare to someone like, how did, it, how did they manage to survive in comparison to Tulsa? Yeah, so um, the language, they, they really did. And I think it depended in part on where they were sent. So if there was a big group of them, they could very easily um, hold on to their language. In fact, um, uh, some of them never, especially those who were probably a little bit older, never learned to speak English or, or spoke only a few words of English. It probably also depended on who they were enslaved to. So some of them were enslaved in their enslavers' households. So, of course, those those girls, young girls, are forced to learn English, English because they're so close to their enslavers and having to, having to labour for their enslavers. But, um, but they do, they hold on to their language. What's sad is that um, their, their children tend not to learn it. There was a sense of shame that they get, you know, they're seen as, the, all these racist ideas about Africa, they're seen as their cultural practices, beliefs are, are disparaged, they're called savages, you know, they're having to battle... Um, battle those perceptions which means that their children are you know understandably aware of those the way in which their parents are seen so tended not to use their African names and they tended not to not to learn their parents language very sadly um, which is really sad and in terms of yeah in terms of the talk yes because obviously what's so striking I was talking to a journalist who published a book um, called Africa Town so he published his book a year before I published mine um, we were talking about that similarity between the racist terror that's happening in um, in Africa Town, just outside Africa Town, in you know, 1906, 1907. I was talking about. I think I used the word. It's Tulsa esque, isn't it? And he said it absolutely is because he's written about. So he's write, written about Africa Town, you know, up until the present day. So the environmental racism. So I can't imagine. I mean, they don't talk directly about the violence that's occurring around them, but I can't imagine. You know what? What, how, what that does to your sense of, of self and, you know, when you feel unsafe in the, in the place that you live. Um, certainly, I think um, there was, I, I mean, I noticed actually in a, in a, in a biography of uh, the baseball player, Hank Aaron, who was from um, uh, that area, that they, there's a reference to this, the, these double lynchings in 1906. Um, as being a kind of a, a trauma that's, you know, that his, historical trauma that isn't forgotten within the wider community. So you can imagine from that how, how scary and how horrible it must be for them. And I think that really also refers to the concept of weathering, 
mm. that having to live with racism on an everyday basis um, does have that effect mentally and often physically as well that yeah. there is much more research about that now that we know we kind of instinctively know that because we know our experience but to have that to have that and the evidence on it is really really important thank you um there's a gentleman here and then do we have any questions online after that great Hi. thank you dr durkin uh, fascinating talk um may i ask you about the the other end of the journey the, the kidnapping you said the Oyo state was possibly where they came from. Do you know what happened? Were they kidnapped by the Sokoto Caliphate? Because at this time, exactly 1860, there was many slaves in the Sokoto Caliphate of northern Nigeria and Niger, as there were in the whole of the United States. Yeah, so this is the other direction. So this is the Dahomey, um, this is the Dahomey Kingdom. So uh, King Lele of Dahomey is at war with um, Abay Okuta, um, which is a region just, you know, not too far away from, uh, um, from Oyo. And um, he, he doesn't attempt, he, he, he tries to capture, you know, or to, to conquer that territory, he doesn't succeed, and he appears to redirect and reroute it to this, this very small town. Um, and the town, so it's a night raid, so what happens, or actually very early, morning raid so everyone's asleep when when they um, invade they attack and um, and the, the whole community is destroyed because they, they they're not ready for um, they're not expecting attack in the, in the night so they they're not able to defend themselves and the whole according to Abache um, one of the survivors the whole community is destroyed in the space of half an hour it's burned to the ground and of course, most of the adults are, are, are killed, and most of the children, in, the children and young people are taken to be sold. They're taken then to uh, Weida and the present-day Benin, and, and sold there. They're held in barracoons for for three weeks before um, this Canadian ship captain named William Foster comes along and and buys 125 of them. So and he boards 110 of them. So yeah. Online. Yeah, so um, two questions from Bandit Queen online. Um, Lovely, we love Bandit Queen. Yeah, the first one I think you've touched on slightly when you talked about the passing down of stories between generations, but um, she asks, did any of the survivors keep or write their own narrative of their experiences? Um, and her second question, I was wondering how slavery was so vehemently defended and enabled in America up to the 1860s after the trade was outlawed in 1808. How was this terrible crime enabled for so long? Yeah. So, unfortunately, as I think I mentioned to the, to the lady over there, um, very sadly, um, most of them couldn't speak English or, or not very, you know, they, most of those who learned English learned, you know, that, that it was imperfect English. So, and of course they, you know, they, they didn't, um, they, weren't, they weren't literate. One of the survivors, Ossi Akibi, um, developed his own technique, own sort of method of writing to record, to record the, to keep a record of what he produced and sold. Um, but they, could, they weren't able, very sadly, to, um, to communicate, their own, communicate their own stories because they weren't able to write and many of them couldn't speak English. So struggled to communicate their stories um, in a, in a you know, significant way to their interviewers, very sadly. Kazula is very striking because he, because Zora Hurston writes a book, you know, it's a book length interview with him. So that is by far the most extensive interview or record of any Clotilda survivor's life story. Um, and yeah, sorry, forget the second part. Second was, yeah. um, uh, how how was slavery so vehemently defended and enabled um, up to the 1860s when it was outlawed? in 1808 so so far previous previously yeah absolutely so obviously um it's and of course this is a slave trade versus slavery because of sli the reason why um the this the certain people in the deep south want to reopen the slave trade is because they because of slavery because of their economy cotton basically cotton um, you know, they cotton is incredibly profitable, and I should say as well that most of this cotton, of course, is going to Liverpool. Mm -hmm. So, it's like eighty-five to ninety percent of this cotton is going to Liverpool. So, Britain is completely uh, implicated in this slavery economy of the of the South. Um, it's just not in a direct way. So, in a way that we can kind of pretend we weren't involved. But anyway, so yeah, they 
enslaved people are expensive, which is you know, a horrible way to describe it, and they want cheap labour. Um, and it's actually cheaper to reopen to reopen the slave trade than to try and buy people from the upper south. So it's all about economics and greed, basically. And I, and I think it's you know it's important to say, as you're saying, that you know the difference between abolition of the trade and abolition of slavery, and you know we can't forget that in terms of the the British Empire. Mm slavery was abolished, but then people were put onto apprenticeships. So for another kind of six, 10, 15 years or whatever, and then you have sharecroppers in the US. So nominally changing the legislation doesn't actually change the reality on the ground. Um, and in many ways made it worse for formerly enslaved people because you know they then had to find places to live. They had to find, um, they had to find employment, which was possibly in some cases worse. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the whole sort of, yes, we abolished slavery in this year <laughs> narrative um, really does need to be, does need to be challenged. Mm -hmm. More questions in the audience? I know there were lots of hands up. I'm going to be very convenient and ask this lady here because you're right there. Um, I wanted to ask, how, how are you received when you go to explore and research this? Do you find people want to talk and share about what they know? Or do you find there's a lot of trust building you have to do to, to get people to share their information? Yeah, so with the descendant community, I mean, they've just been incredible. I mean, I think it means so much to them, actually, to... I mean, a lot... So, the, obviously, the research is quite mixed, so some of it is genealogical. Quite a lot of it is genealogical data. Some of it, they, there is a Clotilde... Um, collection on the Mobile Public Library website. So when I was researching this book, I mean, so much of the research was done under lockdown. So, so much of this research was me uh, going through, you know, looking, looking online, digitised newspapers. I, you know, benefited so much from the digitisation of information. Some of it as well was, I mean, descendants keep contacting me. So most of the descendants, most of the Clotilda survivors outside of Mobile haven't been, or hadn't been identified until this this book was published. It, I felt like I was on a bit of a solo journey to try and find and identify and tell the stories of those. And I should say they, ha they haven't been, or, as in they haven't been, or they have been by their descendants, but they haven't been formally. So it it meant a lot to when I went up to Selma um, to descendants of Matilda McCrea at the end of the day to to have her name in a book and to have a story and 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 the book to be recognised was you know one descendant was telling me I'm going through surgery but this is helping me through surgery to see it and so things like that can't ask for better but also descendants have been contacting me so Marquis Watkins who's a young man um, but he's passionate about his ancestry even though he's young um, he has you know he was he reached out to me because he's been battling to get his ancestor, Amy Greenwood Phillips, recognised. And I, when, he, when he reached out to me, I'd already identified her as a Clotilda survivor. He was so thrilled because, you know, he'd struggled. Because, unfortunately, I mean, one of the problems with genealogical data is it isn't always accurate. Um, so, you know, she was Alabama-born, according to the, this document. But he had, a, you know, he had oral histories with his ancestor. You know, her grandson had... Um, had record, you know, they'd recorded this interview. It's de other descendants had recorded an interview with his grandson, uh, with her grandson, I should say, from about 1984. So from before Mar when Marquis Watkins was born, that record, you know, recorded her story, and because Marquis shared that with me, so I could then add more information about her in my book. Um, there was another family, uh, so the descendants of, of Uriba Riggins. Uh, they'd, I don't know when they'd created this but they had their own family history book that again they shared with me um, that recorded her story even though she died in about 1883 so they, you know this is incredible work done by descendants to keep um, family histories alive and I was able, although her name doesn't appear on any census I was able to match her up with a woman with a different name who was living you know I, so we could then say that this woman named Lily Nicholl is your ancestor. So I was able to, you know, they were able to join the Clotilde Descent Association because I was able to make that direct connection. So it's been really special. Any more questions online before we go back to the audience? Just one from Angela. Um, what was the gap in time between the Clotilde and the last previous enslavement voyage to the US? 
about 19 months. So it's, so it's not the only, um, there are other attempts to land um, African people in, um, you know, in the United States on the eve of the Civil War. So the Wanderer, and really horribly, so the Wanderer, um, there's, they're mostly little boys, young boys, teenage boys, and very young men who are trafficked from, from West Central Africa. So um, really from, from sort of the Angola area. Um, and the, the attrition rate, the, the death toll on the slave ship is incredibly... It's, it's a much bigger ship, and, and there are about... I forget the figures, but I want to say there are you know, well over 400 people on this ship and only about 300 survive. I think that's right. I'd have to double-check those figures. But this lands in Georgia in November 1858. And the survivors of that voyage are scattered. In fact, I had a bit, my work cut out really trying to... Because some of the Clotilda survivors are identified in the historical record as wanderer survivors. So the Clotilda voyage is kind of denied. In fact, historians dismiss it well into the 21st century or up to the 21st century. Um, so descendants have had a battle, you know, getting recognition um, f for that history. And, um, but yeah, that, so these, the survivors are scattered around, you know, um, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina. Um, and yeah, I think it was, yeah, I felt like I was, I felt that there's a, there's a book I could have, could write, I guess, could have written about those survivors as well, because many of those haven't been formally identified and I was finding newspaper interviews with them and uh, so yeah but this there's a real this is part of a wider effort to reopen the slave trade on the eve of the civil war yeah so yeah thank you back to the audience gentleman here Hi. it's changing the subject slightly what what was different with the experience of the uh, Africans enslaved and brought to Jamaica and uh the, the British West Indies, or in fact the French West Indies, what was different about that and the American South? Yeah, so, I mean, w one difference is, I mean, I guess it's a different different crops in one sense. So, um, I mean, I guess it would be hard to kind of give a big, a big overall comparison, but um, I should say as well, more people were sent. So Jamaica, a million people were sent to Jamaica uh, Jamaica alone, so of course it's Britain. So Britain, Britain traffics about, I think it's, it's 3.25 million people. So of that 12.5 million, a large number of them are, are shipped by the British Empire, right? Um, but of course it's the sugar industry, mo you know, the, I mean sugar is so s significant to the development of chattel slavery in the Americas. Sugar is such an, in you know, such an intensive crop in that, that this kind of legitimizes if that's what you know this horrible mm. method of labor i mean sugar as well has to be processed uh, and the place it's produced it has to be processed very quickly because it ferments and spoils right so so what this ha creates is a sis horrible system of labor that's um dependent you know um that you know that that's kind of what fuels the this whole um trafficking of african people in the first place but what you get, of course, in the, Ameri in, in the United States of America is what really fuels that um, slavery in America is the con cotton. And cotton really grows. So cotton is this minor crop. Well, no one's wearing cotton in like 1760. But in, the, in 1860, it's, it's, the, it's the main crop of the world, you know, glo of the world basically. It's the, it's, the, it's the 19th century's, you know, sort of chief global commodity, really. And this is all because of slavery, all because of the wealth generated by by cotton, it's the expansion of expansion of the United States into the you know deep South because the area where many of the Clotilda survivors were sent is that you know the cotton belt of um, of the southern um, of Central Alabama, you know, stretching through you know into Mississippi. This this is where cotton grows best. This is why the Clotilda survivors are sent to Central Alabama because this is where the wealth is. If that makes sense. Probably doesn't really answer your question that well, but. Um, it's, yeah, cotton versus the emergence of sugar and then the emergence of cotton in, in the United States. And I think the two things aren't necessarily separate because, no. for example, um, enslaved people were sent from Barbados to South Carolina. Mm. Um, and so there, is a, there, is, there are journeys between the Caribbean and different parts of the Caribbean within the Caribbean, but also 
also over to the state. So it's it's a little bit more more complex. Absolutely, and also just to just to jump in on that. I mean, what's significant as well? I mean, you look at so San Domingo or Haiti, present day Haiti and Jamaica. Those are like the. the I mean. <laughs> They, these are the ri richest, obviously richest and, and, uh, um, for certain people, but these are the richest um, territories in the, in the 18th century. Right? These, this is, these are the places that generate all the wealth for France, Haiti for France, and uh, Jamaica for, for Britain. So, yeah, so these are, this is fueling so much of the wealth of the 18th century uh, Atlantic world, basically, the slavery, um, oh, sugar, slavery and in Haiti and Jamaica. So we've got time for one more question. And a gentleman who's been waiting very patiently up there. Uh, thank you. You spoke of the raising of sort of statues to the Confederacy after the Civil War, and obviously the fact that the ship still remains, although it's um, you know under water and there's difficulties of raising it. What sort of physical memorial is there, if anything, to the Catilda? And if not, what is sort of the broader picture of the monumentalization of slavery in the South, as opposed to the sort of legacy of monuments to the Confederacy? Yeah, so, so in terms of what survives, so in terms of Africa town itself, the only structure that remains, so, so much of Africa town was bulldozed by by developers, right, who want to, you know, want to build a highway. Um, so not much of, so the only thing that survives is this chimney that was built by um, one of the survivors named Gumper, um, who was the only, uh, the only, the only man who was a, a fond, um, he was, well, he was part of the Dahomey kingdom. Um, so that's all that survives of the community that was built by the Africans in Africa town. But there has, in terms of a physical, um, memorial in Africa. So the, the, there's just been, um, there's now a heritage house um, and basically they're building a museum. So the, the building, so they have, um, they have a sort of tourist space to go and visit. And obviously if you're in Alabama, I highly recommend that you go and visit the uh, you know, heritage house in Africa town, which is, you know, they have an exhibit to the Clotilda survivors. But that only opened last year and that opened because of the attention that the Clotilda was receiving because they you know they identified it and suddenly there is this money if it hadn't if they hadn't um identified the Clotilda in the Mobile River then I'm sure nothing would have been done for the community in that sense you know Alabama you know Alabama, Alabama tourism has to kind of respond to that so there there certainly isn't very much I know I'm not sure exactly how many of the I mean, so many of the Confederate monuments, thankfully, have, have been taken down, but of course they haven't all been taken down. Um, but yeah, there's certainly, there's certainly much more to be done to, um, to memorialise, and it's an ongoing battle for the descendant community in Africa town um, to, you know, to ensure there is proper recognition. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just terrible that it takes, you know, it takes until 2010, 20 for so much of these monuments to be torn down and that it takes the you know the identification of the Catilda to for for a proper memorialization to be established in Africa town so yeah a lot more to be done basically and I'm sure that this book this talk um, and to the many people watching at home will also play its part in making sure that we do memorialize um, that experience and that it, the what those people went through and, and their lives, which this book does in fact do. So I'd like you all to join me in thanking Hannah and also our... <laughs> and also our fabulous BSL signers as well, thank you. And I hope everybody's enjoyed this session of HistFest. There's much more to come. Um, and thank you for being here. And thank you to everybody online. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you. And thank you.